All so, right, you guys. So now we're recording. Now we're recording. This is this is an official. This is official. Thanks. So this so welcome to our our do drop this afternoon, you guys. So um, we had a little bit of a a, a crazy start with uh, Sacramento testimony and people driving across the state and everything, but it's all good. We're all here. So Joanna, our guest, is a graduate student at UC Irvine. We're going to chat for a couple minutes, and then we're going to open it up to everybody to to ask questions, and and we can talk about whatever. So let's first talk about. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about your history before we start talking about oil spills okay. or anything. So, okay. so born in Brazil, moved here, what, 15, 20 years ago? What? Uh, 20 years ago. So, so tell, give, give yes. us, give us the arc of your story. Oh my gosh. Okay. Born and raised in Brazil. Um, and then I, um, got my undergraduate degree there in Brazil. Um, there are a few places, a few universities where you can get a bachelor's degree in oceanography, which is something that is not very common here in the U.S. Um, and um, very lucky, I was very lucky to, to kind of come across that program and, and to get my degree there because that gave me an opportunity to get involved in research very early on. So I was a junior, right, as, as an undergraduate student, but I had the opportunity to be mentored by a professor who was fantastic. And uh, she was the one who introduced me to phytoplankton. And so awesome I, phytoplankton. Awesome phytoplankton. I fell in love immediately with it. You know, I went to uh, started school and I, I imagine a lot of students who might be listening to this um, testimony here, this, this <laughs> biography might be in this process of trying to figure out what they want to do, you know, with with for the rest of their lives and stuff like that. So that's my, my story is funny because when I started studying oceanography, I saw myself as being someone who would study whales or sharks or penguins, you know? And then I got this gig at this phytoplankton lab, which was phytoplankton, <laughs> I didn't even know what, exactly what that was, but it, it was paid, it was a paid internship. So I went there. First week I just washed bottles. They put me yep. in a washing The grunt, room, the, the grunt. low the low level. And eventually this nice lady who was a scientist took me to this other room that had microscopes <laughs> and she's she showed me for the first time a live sample of phytoplankton and i remember to this day i was i fell in love i was just so shocked that all that beauty and all that um all that life existed in a few drops of seawater i was just mesmerized and i, I felt like i felt wronged how could i had, had i lived that long and not seen the beauty and not had right. seen that before right. And so I fell in love with phytoplankton right there. Um, and um, that initial moment really kind of um, gave me, kind of opened the next doors that I was able to go through. So it was because of my involvement in that laboratory that I then got an opportunity to come to the US, uh, first as an exchange student uh, while still an undergraduate there. And then I got invited to come back to the University of Delaware and get a master's degree in marine policy and science. Is that where is that where you did your undergrad exchange? Delaware? Yeah, yes. I went there for a six month exchange student program that was funded by um, Fulbright. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and it was a marine policy program and I was a scientist in a team that was interdisciplinary. So I worked for six months with this group that had econo economists, it had, um, government specialists, you know, policy specialists, and I was there as the phytoplankton person, uh, water quality person, the scientist, and I loved that. I just absolutely thrived in that interdisciplinary environment. And so I came back to Delaware for my master's, and then, of course, I fell in love and, you know, met the, the person who then became my husband uh, there. He was a master's student in the physical oceanography program, um, so after I finished my master's, I went to Hawaii. I got a job in Hawaii, working for the state. The state of Hawaii was um, looking for someone that could help them with their response efforts to contain invasive species. So mm -hmm. Hawaii has a huge problem with aquatic invasive species, like invasive algae and invasive um, everything. Everything. Invasive invasive everything. everything. Exactly. And so at the time I was, my master's thesis was on with ballast water. So again, phytoplankton was in part of, you know, why I got that, that project, um, I got to do that project. And then, yeah, and then in Hawaii, I worked with this team again, an interdisciplinary team, and it was a management job. 
but then you know my then fiance was uh, here in california so we got married and i moved to california so love drew you back to love, love drew you to california right? love made me give up a job wow in Hawaii. wow that's love, wow right? aloha love. aloha love love right. that's good only love and so, yeah. and you originally came to Southern California, or were you guys somewhere yeah, else? Yeah, no, we. Uh, he was a PhD student at uh, UCI, mm -hmm. getting a PhD in exact same program I am in now. And um, he now works for NASA JPL. He works with uh, global hydrology and climate change. But yeah, I can't. I was still did not know what I wanted to study for my PhD. So I decided to take a little break. Right, that was the decision after the master's. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna take a little break. 10 years went by. <laughs> Funny how that happens. Funny how that happens. I started teaching. I taught community college for several years, for eight years. I love teaching. I love, you know, uh, everything that I was able to do in a community college environment was just fantastic. I worked with so many different um, students and, and we did projects, communication projects, science projects. And I love that um, the opportunities that you get to explore. But I wanted to get a PhD. I just want everybody to call me doctor. That's pretty much. I want to be doctor mom. So I have I have a daughter. I want to make sure she calls me doctor mom. You know, I I'm no longer married to that love of my life, and so I want him to call me doctor X Y. <laughs> right. We're best nice. friends. We're best nice. friends. Nice. So you know, so that's it. I really want to get this PhD. I wanted to understand climate change. My students started asking me very good questions about climate change that I felt I needed. Um, I needed to understand the problem better in order to give them mm -hmm. complete answers. Mm -hmm. And so the time was right and I went back and now I'm finishing my PhD. That's incredible. Again, how time flies. Five years have gone and now- Five years is fast. Yes, That's five so years. fast Believe for a PhD. It's oh crazy. my God, oh my God. Okay, cool. So then, so then so that's, ex that's an excellent biography. Now give okay. us give us the the overview of what your, your PhD is on. Tell us about pollution and how that relates Ooh, okay. and all that stuff. Right. So it's a little bit of a stretch. So you guys have to kind of be patient here with me, okay? Because uh, there's a lot, if you, there's a lot of background that you need to understand in order to see the beauty of what I'm trying to accomplish with my thesis. But here it goes. Um, we have a suspicion, right? Just in science, you obviously start with some kind of like hint. We have kind of a, a suspicion that the combustion of fossil fuels in the engines of boats specifically ships large ships right but smaller boats might actually be contributing to this too so that combustion of fossil fuels when that when the the smoke is released right because you have the engine the engine is combustion the fossil fuels that stuff comes out of the smokestack and that stuff is going to be enriched the air that comes out of the smokestack is going to have all this soot and it's going to have all these metals mixed in it because there are impurities in the in the fuel uh and then it's also going to have a lot of nitrogen which is a byproduct of combustion of any fuel not just mm -hmm. fossil fuels okay so you have all that it's in that plume we call that the plume it's what comes out of the smokestack that plume starts to interact with the atmosphere and eventually settles on the surface of the ocean okay so what we've we, scientists, what particularly modelers, have been um, speculating modelers. Modelers, modelers. modelers and their math, right? Like they do all this mm. math and they're like, mm. hmm, there's something missing here with the iron budget. So they want to know where there's, where there's possible sources of iron coming from. And so there was this speculation in a few papers that maybe this smoke coming out of the smokestacks of ships and, and, mm -hmm. and boats might actually be serving as an artificial source of iron. Once that iron settles on the surface of the ocean, that might be serving as a nutrient for phytoplankton to grow. Okay, so that's kind of the premise of my thesis. So far, with the feet, with the smoke that I've been able to acquire and the aerosols, we call them aerosols, these particles that will be in the, in the plume of the of the ships, um, we haven't really been finding a lot of iron. So so far, hmm. we're kind of not supporting the speculation hmm. of the model. Interesting. However, okay. We are finding a lot of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And every time that I simulate this process in bottles and in what we call incubation experiments, we see growth. The final so it's thing fertilizing. Find, it's fertilizing. So it's a, now that was the first part of the question, right? But you know, to get a PhD, apparently you have to work harder than that. They really want you to prove that you know some science. Be or poor something. for you a gotta, while. Yeah, yeah, you gotta you gotta yeah. suffer a little more. Yeah. So the next question then was okay, so 
we see a, this artificial fertilization happening. The question is, are all the phytoplankton that are naturally there, will all of them be growing at the same rate? Or could this artificial fertilization effect may also be affecting the types of phytoplankton that thrive? Mm -hmm. And that would be causing a change in the natural, what we call the composition of that community, right? So you could be changing the structure of that community. You could mm -hmm. be giving an, a fake, um, or, or a, or, what's another word? Like a, a artificial a, signal yeah, a or a forcing function. Yeah, yeah. a non-natural advantage, competitive advantage to some groups, right? So um, that was the next question. And so I got smart because, Excellent. you know, eventually one has That's to good. do that. That's good. And I'm like, what can I do? How can I make this more fun? So I'm like, what about if I study this in the middle of nowhere, where there is not a lot of input of nutrients from anywhere? And so I don't deal with like background noise. L take me to Bermuda, right? And I just wow. wanted to go to the <laughs> paradise. I really, the truth is that I really wanted you to. You wanted to wear those short field. shorts and, that weren't super short, yeah, but they're a little bit yeah, longer. Exactly. Yeah, right, I yeah. just wanted to go to paradise right, and right. I got to do it. And That's so good. I went, I just got back from Bermuda a few weeks ago and I got to do my experiment there. And now I'm analyzing the data. And so the, the question we're going to be answering now for this chapter, usually for a thesis, you want to do three or four chapters. And so for this chapter, I'm going to be looking at the genetics. I'm going to be looking at hmm. whether or not we see a response and a change in the types of organisms that grew. That's cool. Now, I, I, I was so at Stanford, one of the issues we were looking at were butterflies in patches of remnant coastal grasslands, okay. serpentine grasslands, so very um a uh, uh, sort of toxic hard to grow in ecosystems notoriously um uh, they, they look like they're water starved so the plants aren't super lush and they're kind of scraggly um primarily because of the metals in these soils make mm. it very physiologically hard for these plants to grow etc mm. um been being invaded in recent decades by non-native grasses invasive grasses okay. and one of the mechanisms that people were proposing this was, you know, 20 years ago when, when I was up there, whatever, 25 years ago, um, was fertilization from cars. So car mm, exhaust. Yeah. And when they first said that, I said, you are totally high. Like that, <laughs> like that. I mean, even though there was very heavy right. freeways, lots right. of traffic, right. but then they, my colleagues ran the numbers and looked at deposition rates and it was like, oh my God, we right. really literally are fertilizing the sides of our roadways with so much traffic, yeah. vehicle traffic. So we, do you want to nerd out on that? Yeah. Let's nerd, total, let's nerd out on that. Okay. So here's the deal fuels, fossil fuel, we talk about traditional fuel, right? Like the stuff that you put in your car traditionally. So gasoline, right? Or diesel. Um, they're these- Wait, say diesel again. Diesel. Diesel, <laughs> okay, that's, yeah, I like that. That's the Brazilian diesel, this I like that. Diesel, right? So, and, and the more I drink, the more Brazilian I get. So um, <laughs> the accent gets heavier. Excellent, so excellent. You know, like we're, excellent. we're, that's we're good. just starting that's good. here, so. Mm. All right, so these, these things that we use in our cars, this particular here in the United States where there is a lot of um, regula oh, yeah. regulatory mm -hmm. effort to, to keep the air clean. Yeah. Um, these, these fuels are extremely refined. So they are gonna be relatively clean in terms of impurities. So where are the metals coming from? It's not just iron, right? Iron mm -hmm. is the one that we are looking for, mm -hmm. but there's more stuff in fuels and that's what we call impurities. Fuel itself is gonna be hydrocarbon. Like mm -hmm. if you could have just pure, pure fuel, it's going to be hydrocarbon. And the more refined, the more expensive the fuel. You know, when you go to put, put gas in your car, you have like the option Supreme, extra awesome Supreme, the more expensive ones, and then, you know, crappy one. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. so what you're choosing is how refined that stuff is, right? And, and sometimes they put additives in it too. But anyways, pure fuel is just hydrocarbons. It's rarely ever found pure, and then it's going to have all these impurities, and that's what the metals will be. Iron, copper, mm -hmm. lead. Remember mm -hmm. lead? Lead was mm -hmm. a big problem. So there's a lot of regulation to remove lead. Sulfur, which is not really a metal, but it's like something that contaminant. Is, yep. is a contaminant mm -hmm. and it causes health problems. So all of this stuff would be in a very, what's called a very uh, untreated field. Now, the stuff that ships have historically used to power their engines is the nastiest bunker fuel. Bunker crap, fuel. It's crap crude. Fuel. It's yeah. like it's yeah. uh, is the closest thing to it's worse than crude because it's residual fuel. It's the stuff that is left over after they take they remove the gasoline and all those nice things. 
So the stuff that the engines of ships will be burning will have theoretically a lot of impurities. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So the thing about when you said that oh, you guys are high, I would have said that too because, but maybe what you said 20, 10, 20, 10 years ago, Again, it depends on what kind of traffic we're getting near that right, road. Right. If right. you're getting a lot of trucks, and so you're getting a lot of this fuel that might not be, you know, what you'd be pumping into your nice little Maserati, because you wouldn't get. So <laughs> wow, it, Maserati. Wow, like, that's I don't nice. know, like that's you know, good. like whatever you want to, whatever fancy car you want to drive, you're not gonna put like nasty stuff in it. So if you're getting some traffic that will be rich in those impurities, sure. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. they could mm -hmm. be fertilizing everything. I'm sure in countries that are not the the quality of the fuel is not as regulated as here, you probably do get a lot of utilization on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm going to open up in a second to for people that want to start asking questions, but I'll just say that um, you know th that's also a theme I think I've noticed in many different uh, I've personally experienced in many different uh, times and places, which is you know people say oh is are ships fertilizing the ocean or whatever and the first pass is like no way probably not i mean theoretically maybe but probably not and then when we look closer like oh my god the the footprint of our species on this planet is so strong and it, and and the ripples go so far that that almost almost now when people say something i go oh yeah that's probably that it probably might, happens it might be, that yeah, probably it happens. Might be. Yeah, exactly. So in my case, you know, we don't know yet if ships are fertilizing. Right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to bring all this information that we found experimentally to the modeler so that they can scale up what I found in my experiments to like what we call basin, basin wide, mm -hmm. you know, grids, larger scale, large scale. But we do think that in certain places, especially specifically areas that are like semi enclosed, like the Baltic Sea, mm -hmm. um, that, significant. yeah, significant because you have so much ship traffic coming in and the circulation is limited so obviously i'm not expecting to see the same impact in a place like bermuda mm -hmm. or in a place that is open ocean mm -hmm. even the coast of california which you have a lot of circulation mm -hmm. but in places that you have restricted circulation and oh in the depth of the mixed layer too yep. Yep. so yeah so yeah the footprint of our species is something that somehow we gotta come to terms with at some point because we, I know we are small as speck of dust when we look at those big mountains around us, but we can cause some trouble. Totally. And, and as we've been talking about with the oil spill, uh, that it's, it's, there's assault on top of assault on top of assault. So it's, it's all this crazy stuff, maybe from that smokestack and the crazy thing from all this, which you guys, would you guys get everybody probably here listening, understand that. So, so with that, let me, let me open up and see if you guys, you're welcome to unmute and, and ask a question or, or two or three to uh, our lovely guest here. This is so cool. Please ask questions. Or I can keep asking questions if you guys are still pondering. There's, there's some people in the chat. Are, they, are you guys, are you guys so. texting questions? Here you go. Oh, sorry. This is this is this is, oh, this is logistics, earlier. microplastic uh, stuff. Microplastic stuff. Uh, 12. Twelve. We'll meet at twelve, you guys. But uh, okay, let, let me ask. While, they, while they're thinking of questions, let me ask. Okay, so we so I bumped into you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I fell in love with how many times have I heard that? I fell in love with phytoplankton. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, please. That, <laughs> yeah. That, that's the nerdy, that's the nerdy side of things. That's good. <laughs> phytoplankton are awesome. Phytoplankton are awesome. I would say, um, well, let me oh, let me ask this question. What's your yeah. favorite phytoplankton? What's your oh, favorite plankton? Gosh. Oh my gosh, that's so hard. Um, I really love the dinoflagellates in general, mm -hmm. right? So not just because they bioluminesce. No, 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 no. Their actual just shape. Their, their move their motion, their mm -hmm. mobility. Um so phytoplankton, you know, a lot of times you talk even to marine scientists and they think they're all the same. They're all a bunch of green little dots in the water. Uh, 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 no. In fact, I have a YouTube channel, which I should update more often, in which I have a lot of videos that I made with my microscope. Cool. And you can see some really cool behavior. Um, phytoplankton actually have very, very interesting different types of behavior. Uh, and dinoflagellates, in my opinion, are the coolest because they do all sorts of weird things. So they they have they're called dinoflagellates because they have two flagella, and one flagella they use as a whip to kind of propel them forward, right? And the other flagella they use to spin around because they're trying to break the the water resistance around them. That's how they communicate. They get nutrients from the water around them, and it, that water cannot be stagnant. And think we're talking about like microscopic scale, right? So they have to be constantly moving. Think about if you lived in a pool of caramel right like that 
that thing is stuck all around you. You have to keep moving in order to get acquired nutrients from the environment. So they do that and then they move around and then they check each other out. They don't have eyes, right? They're unicell, you know, it's one, one cell. They have, they have eye spot? They don't have, they have the capacity to perceive light. Right, right. And they have the capacity to read chemical cues in the water. Um, so a lot of these dinoflagellates, they are both, they reproduce both sexually and asexually, meaning they can duplicate themselves when things are good. But when things start to go, you know, bad and they know that their population is going to decline, they start reproducing sexually. So they have to find a mate that matches their species. So they keep moving around and bumping each other and like checking each other out and they'll check each other out. And then it's like, you know, it's not my type. And then they'll just move along spin and then around somewhere spin else. Around somewhere. And I have footage that is just so impressive. We don't know how they do this, but they do the craziest thing. So I have footage of these dinoflagellates called, they used to be called Sirachium. They got renamed, oh, yeah, 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 they yeah, got, yeah. got renamed recently. They look like little well, Eiffel what's Towers. The, what's the new, you mean the new genus? Uh, the new, yeah, the genus now got renamed to Triples. So oh. now they're all triples. Okay. So anyway, so the, these guys, we, we all still call them Sirachium. Uh, they, what they do, they'll spin around, right? And then, in my footage, what I saw, I had never seen this before. They will then find the empty case of another dead organism called the tintinus. Oh, cool. They will go inside. Oh, cool, like alien. Go inside. Awesome. And they go inside. Now, listen, they will put one flagella out and start whipping it out like this. Like a cowboy. Calling their friends. Right. The friend will then will come and go inside, too. Wow. And then I'm not going to tell you what they do in there. Wow. Because this might not be appropriate. And then they swipe for this age right group. or left or whatever the kids do. They it might not be direction. appropriate for this age group. Mm, mm, it is mm. in the, well, the fun thing is that the capsule that they use of the dead organism is transparent. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so, super cool. Yeah. That's so super cool. you can imagine like how much fun it was to That's actually awesome. make these videos. So my favorite are definitely the dinoflagellates. I think that they, there's so much about them that we still don't understand. The fact that they are one cell, they're unicellular organisms, and, and they are able to live such interesting and complex lives, including these interactions with others that we still don't understand. It's all happening in a drop of water. It's incredible. So Okay, so before we go to the next question, it looks like Stacey has a question. We have some questions coming in. That's great. But I just, I just want to say for clarity, for my students, we talk about, we've talked about plankton and nectin, right? Mm. With the idea being that some things are primarily moved by currents and some things are moved by the organisms deciding to swim, the sharks and the whales. But, and, and that's sort of, you know, we talk about that and that's the, that's the basic idea for you guys to get the, the term, the, the ideas. But the more we've looked at plankton, we see that they are not purely passive particles, that they will swim, even though they can't swim very far, they'll swim a little bit to get into a current or something and they'll move around. Excellent. So even though the, the, the water is having a huge influence on where they move, they have a much stronger influence than we historically thought in how they move through the ocean. That's such an important point. So yeah, so the, the, the uh, definition of plankton, right? It comes from the Greek word of floating with. So they float with, they cannot fight the current. That's why they're plankton. They cannot fight the current, but that doesn't mean that they don't move, right? They move. In fact, the largest migration in the world is done by zooplankton, which are also moved with the, with the current, but they move up and down in the water column. So if there isn't a current actively pushing them away, they will be trying to move enough, they will be moving enough and so the largest migration, because it's re relative to their body size mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's huge. Like they mm -hmm. go up and down the water column away and, and towards the light up and down every night, every night, every night. So they move a lot, but they cannot fight the current. It's not like fish that can go in the, into the current to travel. If you watched Finding Nemo, <laughs> you saw the, the amazing educational part the, in which the turtles. The East Atlanta, yeah, exactly. East, East Australian so, current yes. or something, whatever it was. Yeah. So, um, bro, exactly. Bro, bra, bra, bra. Yeah. They can't do that. They cannot like work with the current or against the current or get in and out, but they're definitely moving within their scale of, of you know, of distance. That EAC, Stacy has the EAC. Yeah, there you go. So, so, so Stacy, go ahead, ask your question when, and then we'll, we'll start. Oh, I'm actually just gonna kind of tag on to the question uh, here from Eileen, um, who is asking about quantitative skills. And if you're not confident in quantitative skills, also she's tapping into sort of like, sort of the, habits like sort of like um i want to say habits of mind but it's more like kind of you know like how do you kind of get into your own like workflow and everything um and if you know if you're passionate about this field like i'm also i'm just thinking in general like we have our um chemistry colleague here blake gillespie and it's like i feel like people are often drawn towards 
uh, this feel, but then they feel these barriers in these, like, I think that was probably a thing for me, right? Like I was drawn to this, but then I was like, I'm not really a math person, even though I'm the one who does the taxes. Um, so, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. that's how good a marriage we have. God bless you. That's right. So like, what would like, yeah. So what would you say? I mean, I'm just going to like, what Eileen asks is what, what do you say to someone who has a strong passion for marine sciences, but is not a confident, is not confident in their math skills whatsoever. And then she adds and tends to procrastinate, but obviously asking for a friend. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> um, right. So I have a lot to say. Cut me off if I go over time. Uh, Eileen, you're not alone. Okay. This whole, uh, it, it, the reality is that you need to know, you need to know what you're good at. That's important to, and to be honest to yourself about this. If you really feel like it, math is something, it's not just about being good at, right? It's about thinking that you could overcome that barrier to get what you need to get out so depending on what you're going to do in marine science you might not need that much of math all the time you're still going to need to be good enough math you're going to need to pass the classes and it might suck and sometimes you're going to be like oh i can't believe i'm doing this but it might be the case that after you get to where you want to be right you get the degree that you want you might not need to use math on your daily work particularly some with some fields some specific fields so yeah, that might be the case, uh, but there are many, many ways for you to be passionate about marine science and for you to actually be able to honor that, to honor that passion that you have, to, to be true to it, okay? So I, I have a lot of conversations with students and of course you and I are not talking directly one-on-one, one -on -one, so I'm gonna make some assumptions here based on the conversations I have with students. A lot of times I start talking to students and I realize that, they want to do something to protect the ocean, but they don't necessarily attach to this identity of marine scientists. They don't necessarily want to be marine scientists. They just want to do something that allows them to be close to the ocean and to protect, to do something good for the world. In that case, the sky is the limit. You know, there are many professions that you can pursue that will have nothing to do with math. If you hate math, but you're really good in communication, for example, you can be an amazing um, champion for the oceans by being a communication expert that is dedicated to ocean protection. In fact, right now, it's what we need the most, right? We have so much good science already. Uh, and really what is stopping us from doing better as humans on this planet is not a lack of science. It's a lack of political will. It's mm -hmm. a lack of education. It's a lack of awareness. Mm -hmm. So if your passion is for marine, the marine environment, not necessarily science, but the marine environment, figure out what you're good at. Figure out what you enjoy doing. It might be painting, it might be acting, it might be singing, whatever it is. You can connect it back to that thing that you're passionate about somehow. And then the third part of this trife is, I'm spitting on your computer. It's I'm all sorry. good, it's all good, it's um, sanitary. I get so excited. Um, the third thing to ask, so it's what you're good at, what you enjoy doing. And the third thing is what is needed. Right? What is it that the world needs right now that you can do with the things that you're good at and that you enjoy doing? So if in the end of that process, you realize, no, 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 I want to be a scientist. That's what I had to go through, right? I decided like, I want to be a scientist. So in that case, you're just going to have to, it's going to suck, but you're just going to have to do it. You hire tutors if you need, and you sit down and you study and you learn, and you might not be the math, the best person in your class in math but if you just get good enough to meet the necessary requirements you go for it so it, the important thing is to be honest with yourself if you're doing it for yourself because you really want to be a marine scientist then you, you're going to do it but if you're doing it to please somebody else or if you're doing it to just impress somebody else then uh, you might want to reconsider that yeah no totally i think i think you know one of the things we try to give you guys is, is a grounding in these core skills and that's that's really important that gives you opportunities to do various things and stuff but you know we don't think everybody is going to be a gis gis expert we don't think everybody's going to be a, a, a whatever our our analytic expert right it's rather making sure you guys have the base understanding of these skills like that you're literate if you can speak this skill and if, if that's your passion if you if you can Deal, deal with it if you dig it then you can jam and keep going but but we don't expect everybody to 
you know, be be a quantitative queen or king or whatever it is, okay. but rather um, we want you guys to understand the parameters and that gives you power, right. right? Right. This math and this stuff gives you power so that you can at least understand the conversation when it turns to those issues. Mm -hmm. But 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 I think the idea of like finding your passion and what what really motivates you is, is key. Right. It's totally key. And again, I'm going to reinforce what I said earlier, you know, if you decide that that's what you want to do guys a lot of times the vision that you know we're not good in math we're not good in math we don't like math that might be associated with the experience you've had with math so far which might not have been good you know uh in all honesty i did not have the best math teachers they were good people but they were not the best at teaching math when i was growing up and i grew up in the countryside of brazil so you know bless their hearts that i know they were doing the best they could i studied i went to public school in Brazil. A lot of times we didn't even have like a place to sit to, to you know, the teachers didn't have like, right. you know, right. chalk to right. So resource it, challenge, yeah, shall we say. Exactly. And so it's yeah. much harder to, to fall in love with something that you are not able to explore more organically. Like yeah. we do communication, for example, right? Yeah. Like, or, or whatever, like whatever the skills. So also depending on where you are in your path, be open to the possibility that maybe you are good in math. You just didn't didn't figure that out yet. And 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 being and, and discovering that might be painful at first. So you can give it a try, you know, like try a different way. I like tutors. I love like studying with another person or group of peers, like finding peers who are good. I always did that. I would find classmates who were good at things that I was not good at. And I would pay, I still do that to this day. I find collaborators that are really good at what I'm not good at. And then I offer what my strengths are, of course, good jokes, obviously. And then, uh, and then, wow, right? wow. And then, um, you know, and then that's kind of how I see the possibilities. And yeah, but you kind of have to be honest with yourself. Like, don't pursue something just because you think you don't have options. You have options. Awesome. I love it. Okay. So, Kurt asks, I've always wondered how, unless, unless you want to ask this yourself, Kurt, otherwise I'll read it. But if you want to unmute and ask, Otherwise, I'll say uh, I've always wondered how single celled organisms are able to know uh, slash dis or distinguish cells to consume some and then others to move away from them. So he was in, in avoid getting eaten. So he was, yeah. he was talking about phagocytis. Uh, phagocytis. Yeah. I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah, well, you know, That's incredible. There you go. You know what? That's a funny. That's a funny thing. They eat. They eat each other all the time. Right. They eat each other all the time. In fact, we think that that's how the mitochondria came about. Yeah, right, right, uh -huh. right, right. You know, like one microscopic organism that ate another microscopic organism, and they do that all the time. Some of them I still do. Some and, had, had, and had crappy digestive exactly. ability. Exactly. Right. So yeah. some of these dinoflagellates that I was talking about, they will eat other microorganisms. They will digest. They so they don't have they don't have chloroplasts. Oh, they will yeah. eat something one another dinoflagellate that has a chloroplast. They'll digest everything oh. and keep the chloroplast inside mm -hmm. for months mm -hmm. for weeks but they don't live mm -hmm. you know for mm -hmm. a long time mm -hmm. and they will keep that part of the thing that they ate so in terms of eating they're not going to eat themselves obviously and in the way they eat right it's it's fact you know phagocytes they will they will like sometimes envelop, envelop. They will. yeah they will sometimes they'll throw like a, a net like goo thing and they'll capture it and then they'll digest externally some of it and then um there, like I said, a lot of these organisms have the ability to read chemical cues in the water. So they will be somehow selecting a little bit, but it's it's limited. So a lot of times they will be eating things that, you know, that they shouldn't even. Like, yeah, it happens. A lot of times they will be eating. And like, if, but like they're, they're eating the Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> <laughs> they were eating microplastics. Uh, microplastics. Yeah, so we, you know, in covered with Ben and Jerry's. We haven't gotten to dinoflagellates to study how dinoflagellates are dealing with microplastics. But one uh, of my lab mates is studying right now uh, the capacity that zooplankton copepods have to distinguish between microalgae and microplastics. Yeah, cool. And she's cool. showing that they really can't tell them apart that well. They actually, we find a lot of microplastic in the guts of, of these copepods of zooplankton mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they can't distinguish very well. Mm -hmm. So I would think that the dinoflagellates will probably just be taking whatever they find. And, um, but they, yeah, they don't, they won't eat themselves, but they'll eat smaller things that might be from the same group of organisms. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, somebody unmute, ask us another question. Or we actually have now been joined by an audience here. We actually have an, uh, an actual student. Because we talk so, loudly. Yeah, because we talk loudly. So, so anyway, but, but 
anybody's welcome to unmute and just go ahead and ask your guys uh, questions uh, for Joanna. Or I'll ask another interesting question. You can also tell us the uh, YouTube channel. Oh, oh. I'll, I'll put it in. I'll, yes. When we post this, I'll, I'll, put, I'll definitely I put it in. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know from my. Like, it's like yeah. XJZZY double K zero. The hardest probably. to find. Yeah. But I, I have YouTube, I have Twitter, I have Instagram. I don't check any of them <laughs> as often, but I will. Question. The Instagram I know is Jojo Tavares. You can find me on Instagram, and then from there you can probably find everything else. Perfect. Yeah. So somebody said they had a question. Go ahead. Go for it. Yeah. How long? How long does it take to um like gather, establish a baseline of all the plankton in the area? Oh, that's such a great question, Eduardo. Wow. Very good, good, question. good question. Good question. <sighs> you know what? It's a hard one to answer. So um, the answer is a long <laughs> time. No. Okay. So. Usually you want to have a few years enough to be able to find. Okay. So when you, when you're monitoring phytoplankton, the first thing is you're going to do at least one year, right? Cause you're going to get the seasonal fluctuations. You're going to always get some season winter, summer, blah, blah, blah. Well, exactly. So you're going to have you know, one type of organism that will do better at certain seasons. It, depending on where you are, such as in Cal coast of California, you have upwelling season, right? So it's not just summer, winter. Sometimes you have season related to the, sources of nutrients here in southern california we have with upwelling we have a lot of silica that comes to the surface so that we get diatoms and you might have heard of this diatom that causes uh, toxic blooms mm -hmm. that kills the the, mm -hmm. the sea lions the mm -hmm. sudonicha mm -hmm. so you have these seasons that have to do with all these change periodic change so you need at least one year then once you have one year you can celebrate you can drink some beer Woo! Woo! and then you want a five years or six years, because now you're going to try to get El Nino, you're going to try to get other seasons that happen in a multi-year scale. Then you get to five years, you probably like, you know, if you're a like professor, a PhD's done. PhD's done. And you like, you know, you apply for a job somewhere and hopefully that one. And then now you're going to want to do extend for 10, 15 years. Now you're going to be able to start seeing these larger time scales in action and how organisms may actually replace others depending on chains. For example, if you have a river that starts to uh, discharge a lot of nutrients, right? That's not gonna be an overnight change that you're gonna see. You're gonna see a gradual change of that community adapting. So the answer to your question, Eduard, is really depends on what you're studying. If you're studying the immediate impact of an oil spill, a few months will be enough especially if you already have a baseline. The, the study that we're doing, we're piggybacking on a 10-year monitoring program baseline. So 10 years of data, right? From who? For From the who? Martini, Adam okay. Martini. Okay. Right? We also have five years of a, of a somewhat of a monitoring program with the Orange County Sanitation District mm -hmm. that we've been doing through the Mackey Lab. Mm -hmm. So we have a little bit of a understanding of who should be in the water this time of year. But if you really wanna claim that you understand the phytoplankton of a certain region, you wanna have 10, 20 years of data, that is solid. In a lot of places you will have, a lot of coastlines will have those really long time, uh, timelines which is pretty neat and and i want to encourage you guys as as young people um you can create your own data set right so our roadkill public opinion polling all kinds of stuff right that starts with a year or two and then it's like we'll monitor for another year our sandy beach monitoring all that kind of stuff stuff you're passionate about just start taking notes right what birds do you see out in front of your window uh, those kind of things that that doesn't seem like it's a it's a very complex thing or a super sciencey kind of thing. But if you record things consistently and, and, and over time, fantastically important data sets. Right. And another way to get involved is through citizen science programs. We're not, we, finally, we're not calling citizen science anymore. We're calling them community science programs. It's really cool. So uh, you can join these volunteer groups. So I created a volunteer a <gasps> community group in, in Bolsa Chica. Ooh, we have the, the flow wetland, program. The wetland. the wetland. So if you, okay, this one I know. So if you Google <laughs> Bolsa Chica flow, you will find the website for this group. We've, um, so my daughter is seven. That means the group is eight years old. 
and we've been collecting samples. We only look for harmful algal um, phytoplankton. Yeah, so only the phytoplankton that may be toxic. That's what we monitor there. And we are a collaboration with the California uh, Department of Public Health because they do a biotoxin monitoring program. So you can join forces with other nerds, I mean, other people. Right, cool um, people, cool people. Cool people. Um, that want to kind of track what's going, and again, choose you know what you're passionate about and um, find a group. Yeah, I mean, you can be a lone, a, you know, kind of like the a lone, wolf. lone wolf too. It's okay, but if you, trust me, there will be people interested in what you're interested out there. By the way, we have wolves in Ventura now. Just oh, so wow. You know. Yeah, well, so the gray wolf finally dispersed down. So we've, okay. we've, we again have wolves after about 95 years in, in nice. Ventura. Nice, well done. So that's awesome. Awesome. Other questions, you guys? Uh, Ismail says, how many, oops, sorry, let me move this. How many single. phytoplankton are in a single drop of water? Ooh, Ooh. Which kind of water? We got <laughs> fresh water, salt water, what are we talking Coastal about? Coastal water or right. open ocean right. water, right. Right. right? So it really depends on where you are. So near the coast, more. And more, you know, will be something like, it can be some, depending on wh wh where the coast is, right? So if you're near a source of nutrients, so what is it the phytoplankton need to survive? They need sunlight because they're a photosynthesizer. And just like plants, they're not plants, by the way. Phytoplankton, are, they're plant-like, but they're not plants. They're protists. Plant-esque. Yeah. Plant-esque. Plant yeah. So they need sunlight like plants. But if you have a plant at your house and you put it in the sun and you never fertilize it, over time, that plant is going to die, right? Yep. So very much like the phytoplankton, um, the, the phytoplankton will also need nutrients. So they need nitrogen. They need well, they need they need carbon. <laughs> that's one, but that's plenty, right? They get it from the atmosphere, and we're putting a lot of carbon there. So there's no shortage <laughs> of carbon. We're helping out. We're we're doing good things in oh one sense. Oh my gosh! Right. Yeah, they're not limited by carbon right. ever, right? right? Even before we started pumping carbon in the atmosphere, they were never limited by carbon anyway. So carbon. Then they need nitrogen, and they need phosphorus. So these are what we call macronutrients. They need a lot of it, and then they need tiny little amounts of iron, molybdenum. Cobalt, zinc, selenium, selenium. Depending on the type, they will also need silica. Mm -hmm. If they're diatoms, mm -hmm. they need silica. Mm -hmm. So that combination of nutrients, if there is a lot of those nutrients anywhere, will result in more phytoplankton. So that drop of water will have a lot more phytoplankton. And we're talking enough that if you have, for example, uh, an, like in the Gulf of Mexico, where you have the runoff from the farms, there's just so much nutrients coming in. You have blooms; the water turns green. So you're talking about thousands of organisms in one mm -hmm. tiny little one mil drop of mm -hmm. water right mm -hmm. and that's nasty because what happens imagine you have all these phytoplankton growing right mm -hmm. they grow really fast because there's all these nutrients they mm -hmm. get a lot of light to the surface what starts to happen to the phytoplankton that is underneath that one they don't get enough light so they start to die skanky oh my gosh the whole thing starts to stink mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. they use oxygen because now the bacteria is the nasty the bacteria not photosynthetic they're eating the dead phytoplankton they use up all the oxygen in the water and that causes fish to die. That's what we call eutrophication, okay? And that causes dead zones, the famous dead zones. So in one drop of that water, you're gonna have thousands to sometimes millions of organisms if you count the bacteria. What? Millions of if organisms? If you count the bacteria in like Snap. one mil of water. Wow. Yeah, if you count the bacteria, you can get that high depending on how eutrophied the place is. That's you know, like so for wonderful. phytoplankton, you're gonna be hundreds to thousands maximum, never millions. But if you count the bacteria, which we cannot see with a microscope, you'd have to, you need to like do all the kind of testing for that. So you're talking about a lot of organisms. But for example, where I went in Bermuda, we, I went to one of these uh, really cool places that have one of these time scales. Eduardo, mm -hmm. you were asking about time, uh, time series. So <laughs> there is a, there are two stations in the world that oceanographers The love. famous Bermuda the station. Bermuda station. The Bermuda, it's the, uh, bats. So it's Bermuda Atlantic time series. Time series, right, yeah. And then you have hot, which is the Hawaiian. Oh, I don't know about that one. Yeah, it's the Hawaiian time series. It's the Hawaiian. Absolutely uh, awesome uh, time oh, sorry, series. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, mm -hmm. I should know. Mm -hmm. Anyways, you have hot and bats. These are two stations that are located in really remote locations. That means that they don't get a lot of nutrients. There's no land nearby to give them the nitrogen, the phosphorus. All the nutrients will be coming from air, from like dust that is traveling in the or air. Or your ships. Or my ships. Oh my God, what a great idea to go sample that. I know, right? Oh I'm my a, God. I'm a genius. They should oh give me the CHD already. Oh my God. So anyways, yes. 
So Brilliant. bats and hot are two locations where you have this really long time series. In that water, you're going to find almost no organisms per drop. You're going to have to sample. So, you know, just to give you an idea, when I do my work here in California, usually when I filter water for chlorophyll, for example, I only filter like 200 mil. And I, the filter that I use turns green because there's so much organism. Emerald water. green. Emerald green. When I went to bats, I had to filter two liters of water. Two liters of water, not 200 mil, two liters. And still, sometimes that's not enough. You have to filter more. It's a hint. It's, 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 it's a whiff of green. Exactly. The organisms that grow there are very, very small. Mm -hmm. They're mostly cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. They're very, very small. Because, and why, why is it that small organisms thrive there? Because they're very efficient, right? They're small, so they have a very small surface area to volume ratio. So that means they communicate with the environment much better. And so, you know, it's like, think of like warming up meatballs in the microwave. <laughs> type of thing you know like big meatballs wow meatball, meatballs. Analogies. That's yeah, good. The meatball. Like the that. analogy that's good the meatball analogy is the best one so if you're very very small right you heat up faster in the microwave right if you're meatball because you you know you're transferring heat faster same thing with the phytoplankton if you're small you can thrive in very low nutrient air waters because you're communicating better with the with the environment around you so you transferring you're getting more nutrients even though there's very little in the water to begin with if you are big you're a better competitor but you depend on having all those nutrients now on spaghetti ah. <laughs> okay what are the questions uh here's another question from uh dylan is asks uh, do phytoplankton have any reaction to water temperature oh, yeah. like do they follow more warmer water mm -hmm. currents than cold or do they prefer more colder currents etc they can't avoid it yeah so they do have a reaction to temperature some of them thrive in certain temperature ranges we know that there is. A, 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 I'm gonna be more scientific about it. Oh yeah. On. Let me yeah. let me drink some. Yeah, be be oh. be doctory. I'm gonna be doctory because what if what if my professors that are you know in my committee see this? Oh my, oh my gosh. gosh. Okay. Oh my gosh. So here's what it is. There is a, a there is an observed correlation between temperature and the presence of certain species. Mm. Whether that is caused by a specific. Um, competitive advantage or not we're not quite sure yet okay but we know for example that diatoms in general are more abundant in colder waters and um than in you know than in warmer waters but that might be a that might just be a correlation it might just be because colder waters mean more upwelling more silica mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. we don't know mm -hmm. now can they avoid can they chase warm water like fish do because fish will do that right like they will actually like try to find nectar again nectar. 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 yeah so they can't, that is that is too much for them. They can't really like try to optimize for the temperature range. Now in general, and this is, I'm, I'm going outside of the boundaries here. I'm gonna speculate a lot here. <gasps> now we think, we think, we suspect that in general, just like plants like warmer temperatures better, the phytoplankton like warmer temperature better. So there's a general uh, like a, um, assumption that warmer water in general could cause phytoplankton to grow faster. Q10 right? and everything. Exactly. Yeah. But but remember, nothing is so simple, right? That's why we need beer because nothing is so simple. So That's right. on the other hand, right? Like when we this is coming from like climate change, like how how global warming, ocean warming affect phytoplankton. So the first answer is, oh my gosh, warmer water might make everything grow faster. But on the other hand, um, we also know that warmer water means more stratified ocean. And then that means less of those nutrients that would be coming with upwelling. So we, we don't really know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen to phytoplankton with a warmer ocean. We have a lot of people studying that and we have a very good general understanding, but the details of it, we don't know. But yeah, can they follow warmer current? No, they cannot follow. Mm -mm. Does that cool. answer the question? That's good. I like it. Dylan, That's good. good question. Dylan. Other questions. Anybody can unmute and also ask or ask from the peanut gallery here, they can ask as well if they have a question to ask. Um, so I'm gonna actually, so if we're waiting for a question, I'm gonna say, uh, so tell us about, uh, so so you're a, a pollution queen, right? You're, lo you're looking at, you're looking at, you're looking at how these different compounds Conditions. I'm going to change my things. profile everywhere now. I'm going to be the pollution, pollution queen. queen. You, you, you are a pollution expert. Let wow, me say. That. I like that. So, I, yeah. so, so, um, tell me how you see as you're traveling around Bermuda, Brazil, Hawaii, all these places. How do you see pollution, which is a key, absolutely uh, unquestionable stressor? But how do you see pollution relative to things like 
habitat fragmentation mm. and other categories, mm. extraction, over extraction of yeah. fish or biological resource. How do you, how do you, how, in your professional opinion, how, how much, how much push are we getting from the pollute pollution problem versus the other problems? Right. That's a good, that's a very good question. I don't know if I have a complete answer to that, but of course, because I'm sassy, I'm going to try to answer. <laughs> Let's think about this. Um, so I think there's something to be said about how all these problems are somehow connected, mm -hmm. right? So there's totally. some, well, let's start with the fact that totally. we this there is some there's gonna be a moment that we all kind of have to take a moment a break and like think about how we are living and how we're interacting with the environment and and you know how we're gonna have to come to terms with all those different impacts because when put together together they are causing even a greater impact right, we right. this multi-stress right right um, synergistic synergistic effects. so in terms also let's talk about how pollution is a very broad term right when we talk about pollution we're talking about so many different forms of impacts you can be talking about chemical pollution and then in chemical pollution you can be talking about organic pollution like mm -hmm. nutrients you know like mm -hmm. runoff from mm -hmm fertilizers mm -hmm. from farms or from like front yards and stuff like that or you can have persistent chemical pollution the stuff that will last for a long time ddt oh my gosh they mm -hmm. found barrels of mm -hmm. ddt off the mm -hmm. coast of catalina no mm -hmm. in a deep mm -hmm. the barrels mm -hmm. barrels of mm -hmm. ddt something yeah. that was like, of course that we thought we had of dealt course with. of course persistent right like this is bio the bio accumulates you have mercury which is also bioaccumulate you have you have this new stuff that we don't even know yet how bad it is now these plastic byproducts that are persistent in the water that we don't even teflon you know teflon oh my gosh the byproducts of teflon so there's stuff that we don't even know yet how bad it is right right and then you have uh, other types of pollution that we don't think about noise pollution right that is causing problems for marine mammals so when we talk about pollution we really have to make sure we understand how that fits for that ecosystem and you asking me to rank pollution in relation to other forms of impact oh, stressors, stressors. Yeah, stressors and i think that is an answer that can only be answered when you look at the ecosystem itself some ecosystems right now are extremely impacted by plastic pollution i think mm -hmm. plastic pollution is one of the types of pollution that we have to be able to address. I mean, here we are, you know, like we are so dependent on this is clearly a glass, clear glass bottle that I'm yeah, drinking right. right? Very glass. So or we are so accustomed, we're so it's so ingrained in everything that we do, in and in all the products that we consume. Of course, single use plastic being the worst one, but but you know, plastic is really something that I think we have we're just starting to talk about. In general, for the ocean, I would think that is probably as high as overfishing. Yeah. Okay. As high. Oh, interesting. As, okay. I think so. As high I as think so. I think as high as overfishing. Now, in, if you ask me, what is the greatest threat right now? Is climate change. There's nothing. There's nothing like climate change right now. Climate change is it's affecting so many ecosystems to such an extreme in a way that the. the um, it's actually we need more beer for that one. Because, Whoa, yeah. more beer for climate change? Mm -hmm. We need like we need <laughs> we need like kegs for climate change. We need kegs yeah, for bring some um, tequila. Sorry, yeah. Meaning. No, so in terms of ranking, I really think it depends on where you're looking at. But if you are asking like in general, then plastic pollution probably is. I would say I would the, think the, the public when we ask them, they always say pollution is oh, like is yeah. like. Of course, that's the biggest thing. Right. And and we talk to ex uh, or, or or people that spend more time delving deeply into this stuff. Yes, pollution is a problem, but they but other things are much more equitable in terms of the the, the yeah. worry. Yeah. Whereas the public really, since the '70s, since we started serving this, right. people really, really see yeah. pollution as environmental problems. But let's talk a little bit about this, right? Let's talk about why. I think one of the reasons why pollution is something that gets so much attention is because it's something that is very easy to comprehend yeah, right, right right trash is something that we deal with every day in our lives we take the trash out every day or you know most most households will yeah and so it's something that is very not i, I don't want to use the word easy because it implies that the, the other things are not attainable they are but it's just very tangible it's very part of our everyday life yeah the other stressors are things that might be happening in a time scale and a spatial scale that is sometimes hard for us everyday people to comprehend unless you work with that right so i think there's something to be said about the way we communicate totally environmental problems to the public and how um there are some things that are just easier to grasp and if you think about it 
climate change is a pollution problem. Totally. Right. Totally. Um, no question. Overfishing is not a pollution problem. It's a consumption problem. It's like, a, and it's a man, it's a management problem. Really, that's what it is. It's like a, it's a, a, a tragedy of the commons problem. Really. Um, but you know, but a lot of these other problems that we are dealing with, they they are kind of connected with like a broader lack of management. And so yeah, I think in terms of pollution, you're right. In some places, it might not be the top one priority, but for people, it's easy to understand. I think I think also the in the popular conception, I think, I think it's it's when we ask them about pollution, they they often talk about the <laughs> power plant, the uh, whatever. And so I, th I think it's also yeah. I think what you said is totally right, but I think yeah. it's also uh, the other layer question. is that yes. people are like, it's no. that bad Point guy source. that's doing Point it. Point source. Not me. Yeah. It's I don't pollute, but that. Point, thing over yeah, there that's a good point that's a good point yeah so it's easy to attribute the call the the causative like the blame the, culprit. the blame yeah, yeah the blame yeah, yeah that's yeah. true although with plastics now i think most people realize that it has to do with with our yes um, it, it, and, although i don't think people understand that the how bad it is right it, they don't know that china's yeah. not taking oil. yeah they know they, they know the straw up the turtle's straw, nose yeah. which is an important thing and right. powerful argument but but yeah, the sort of day in, day out. Oh, is can not... I tell a story? Yep, tell a story. Okay, so, you know, a few years after I got divorced, I'm like, you know, it's time. I got to go back in the game. I got to start dating again, you know. Feel, <laughs> you got to go inside that bed, shell yeah, of gotta... a phytoplankton. Right. I, you know, I got to get out of there. Right. I got to do I got to right. do this thing, you know. Right. I'm, uh, you know, I got to, you know, feel, feel right. pretty and relevant. Right. Right. So right. I started, I go, I went, you know, dating sites. And um, create my little profile, and of course, like a tree hugger, you know, like I'm an environmentalist, you know, I, you know, any, you know, like I'm, I'm really serious about this, and if you're not serious about this, it's not gonna work if out. If you don't love the planet, you can't love me. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I found this cute guy, you know, he's a wave photographer. I'm like, dude, perfect wow. for me, like wave photographer, wow. and he also said that he was also a tree hugger, like super into the environment, and we go out on the first date. He shows up with a plastic bottle, very much like this one. Then you have to. You mean you're talking about this bottle this right here? Right what a bastard would buy that bottle! So he shows up with a plastic, single-use plastic bottle. And you're like, game and over. Like, you're like, game oh, over. Swipe up or oh, right or whatever the hell it was. Oh, hello. Swipe you know? left. Swipe I'm left. Like, I'm like, hello. You're cute and everything, but uh, what's that? You know, I thought we had discussed the environmentalists. And it's, it's recycled. Everything. He tells me, "Don't worry, babe. I recycle." And I'm like, no. Nah! Oh, so he's one of those faux, yeah. so, faux dudes. Right. He thinks, I mean, the heart's in the right place, right? We dated for a little while. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that's the, I, I kind of gave him a second chance. Kind of gave him a second chance. Because he was that cute, is what you're saying. He was super cute. Right there. Yeah, uh, right, yeah. Right, I mean, right, I, you know, sure. I gifted him a, a reusable <laughs> bottle with stickers for him to put on and look cool. You know, excellent, I, I excellent. gave him the Yeti, the Yeti excellent, bottle. Excellent. Wow, uh, that's expensive. Oh, Yeti. Wow, he must, really really <laughs> he must have been really cute. He must have been really cute. But you know, like I, what I'm telling the story is to highlight the fact that we really have been relying on this systems solutions for our problems right mm -hmm. like so this guy again he was a he is he is he's a good guy um and um i think the point here is that people very good people believe that if they just do what they're told are decent solutions like oh you recycle then that's fine right then then that they're doing enough and I think it's time that we all start understanding that it's not enough. The yeah. system itself is not functioning in a way that we can just rely on what is available to protect the environment. If you really want to be someone who can put on your Tinder profile that you protect the environment, <laughs> you have to think outside the options that the system is giving you. So recycling is definitely not enough. Unless you just, you know, it's you fine with like the you know, it, not giving a damn, then that's fine too. <laughs> it's totally okay. So it's so it's interesting. So I mean it's like because some people that are so um before the pandemic, um my son and I went to this Boy Scout camp in the Florida Keys. And mm -hmm. one of the dad so we didn't go so normally our troop goes on activity. So a uh, troop we all know each other. It's all the same people. But this was an this was an invitation from a friend of his from school and so it was a it was a group of people that i don't normally interact with and, and it turns out they were they were wealthier folks and they were they were from different backgrounds and i would typically hang out with but in any event so we go there and we go to the florida keys and we spent a week doing all this kind of stuff and initially one of these 
one of these dads that came with us was a, uh, like climate change is BS, not really mm-hmm. real. And I'm like, oh man, really a week with this guy. <laughs> and so, um, so anyway, so we started going around and we started looking and, and he's somebody that if I first looked at him, I'd say, I'd write him off. Say, this guy's not going to be a help. This guy's not going to be part of the conversation. He's not interested in moving the ball forward. He's in listening to his weird news sources and not, right. not, not Selecting. engaging. Yeah. 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 So anyway, so we went out and we were snorkeling and paddling around doing all these cool things in these keys in the southern part of the Florida Keys, uh, massively devastated. Uh, like so, so you know, the, the factoid that they put out is about 70 percent of all the live coral that existed 50 years ago is dead mm. in, in, in that part of Florida and the northern Caribbean yeah. because of a variety, variety of stressors, climate change, heat, sedimentation, all these things. And he suddenly, like day three, he all of a sudden he said, yeah, hey, was, uh, the coral's dead. I'm like, yeah, right. That's what we've been swimming over Ted Gore over the last couple of days. And he said, no, like people need to know this. Oh, and so wow. it was yeah. like, uh, yeah, don't be snarky. Don't be snarky. Yeah, go ahead. Talk to me. And so, and so, and so basically he said, we got to tell people that, like this climate change thing is a real wow. effing thing. Yeah, that- and I was like, yeah, it is. And yes. so, and it wasn't like a, he had that thing that day, like the rest of the trip. He's like, what do we do? We got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do that. And, and so, and so that was someone that, that, um, yeah. that, that sometimes you can get through to yep. folks. Absolutely. The other thing to say about that was when I was an undergrad, when I was where you guys are now, um, there was this book that was 50 right. simple things you can do to save the earth. And so it was like, you know, change a light bulb or we didn't have LEDs at the time. We had a compact fluorescent. Like, Come on. And there was a huge debate amongst my friends about whether that's right. Is it, is it, I mean, in one sense for the gentleman, like we're talking about, it won't do anything. A simple step is going to start you down the road. But the reality is to make significant change, we need massive shifts and a light bulb or two ain't going to do it. That might start you down the path. And so, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very hard call to decide with the situation, with the person, do I tell them just take one little step forward or do I say, look, man, you got to go walk. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I think there's something to be said about, um, coming to these realizations as part of your storyline, right? So when we talk about like managing the environment, we usually look at problems and solu- not problems, solutions for problems, either it, we call them bottom-up solutions or top-down solutions. So you, you might hear that, you might read that in articles. So bottom-up solutions are the ones that we rely on public education, right? We educate the public and we try to change behavior from the bottom up. So people will change the way they do things and you don't have to tweak anything. You don't have to change the laws. You don't have to create economic incentives. You just educate people and the solution comes from the bottom up. The other type of solution is the top down. So you come with a policy, with a new law, with a new regulation and you prohibit things or you create economic strategies to give incentives for certain things. So for example, his, you know, we, for example, have been giving a lot of incentives for people to put solar panel in their houses, right? So you can get like this discount. So that's a top down approach in which you create an economic incentive and it's going to change people's behavior, but not because they were educated to do from. So when you're talking about this, there's, there's a lot of space between those two, right? You can do a lot from both ends. You can do bottom up education and you can do top down approach. I think that where we are at with big, big problems like climate change or plastic pollution, we are at a point that we really don't have time anymore to be Mm -hmm. depending on this moment in which Mm -hmm. someone has this realization because they saw the dead coral or because they got, Mm -hmm. you know, a potential love interest telling them that they (laughs) won't be dated because they're using the wrong type of Oh, Yeti. Oh, Yeti. Yeah, right. So, Mm. you know, these moments, these crucial moments that happen in each individual storylines, they're fantastic and they're important. But right now, we really, those of us who understand that there is a problem, that the problem is urgent, that we have until the year 2030 to do some dramatic change to avoid the worst problems of climate change, we really need to start thinking about top-down approach. Because waiting for people to real, yeah. don't even waste your time on that uncle of yours. Thanksgiving is coming up. You <laughs> might be wanting to convince people that climate change is real at dinner table. Don't waste your time. It's, you know, it is a waste of your time. When you encounter someone that you see resistance because they have what we call mental models that are already like too old, ossified, do not spend your time on it. You know, it's much better for you to be thinking of ways that you can really affect people in a larger scale in a way that is broader because otherwise 
you really gonna we we don't have time for this we really don't have time for this yeah. i don't do that conversation deniers don't you know i just i'm like oh yeah good you know i like a shirt and bye like uh, yeah yeah and one of the things so so Google just now coming out with this with this new ranking when you want to go by by airplanes about, mm. about how much you know carbon is is embodied in this flight and everything. Yeah. And so you know that that that's a helpful thing. But but there's also related to this conversation is this notion that the responsibility is on you. You oh do you gosh. do have a lot of responsibility, but yeah. but to sort of put everything off on you, the consumer or whoever, to somehow read all these books and know all these indicators, that's not really fair, right? I mean, so you should you should educate yourself, but 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 we also have systems in place, right? We have regulation for how fast we drive on the roads and we have to wear seat belts and stuff. And that, you don't create that, that's created by the system. And yeah. so we, we, we should expect that type of help as well yeah. to get us out of this problem. And we have a lot of people who have profited from this little story of like, everybody needs to change their way. Yes, everybody's gonna have to change their way, but it's not something that's gonna happen. Just you wake up and you're like, I'm going to just do everything right. right. I'm gonna grow my hair super long. <laughs> tomorrow clearly it's just not going you know clearly. You, so we know now we know for example so carbon footprint right it's something that we all i was the one i was one of those people that used to tell people calculate your carbon footprint you know and save water when you're showering yeah jerk be in a shower to save water yeah jerk that. Yeah, yeah jerk like yeah. do stuff like that yeah. um you know like do stuff like crazy stuff to you know minimize your your carbon footprint um the pee in a shower is not for carbon footprint. It's for something else. So, anyways, the carbon that's footprint. That's related to plankton again. Turns out, yeah, turns out, you know, the whole idea of carbon footprint I learned recently, and uh, historians have now proven, it was invented by the fossil fuel companies. Man, yeah, yeah, it was part of their paid misinformation campaigns. They actually paid someone to come up with that idea and to publicize. They paid for that to become a thing, and so carbon footprint for footprint was something that was used for years to just keep us busy. We're like calculating our carbon footprints, right? And while they're banking, they're, they're laughing all the way to the bank because, you know, when you when you look at like how the carbon is actually produced, who profits from carbon, uh, who have been profiting historically, it boils down to like a handful of companies. And so- Pernicious. It is, it really is. So it's like the kind of stuff, I'm not saying don't, again, you know, use a reusable bottle um try to fly less try to eat less meat um you know live in a smaller house do all those things for sure if you can but don't think that that is the solution and don't expect other people to actually have to do, don't again don't like go around bullying people to do that because what we really need right now at this point is a systemic change that actually get the people who have been profiting for many years for something that they know pollutes and kills the world to pay back and to actually make things right so there i said it that's great that's good so we have we have some questions still but i think that's a yes. great note to end on i mean oh, yeah. i think i think that that, that that that's a good and positive I can, thing i can answer the questions let's ask the last one if you yeah, yeah so okay so let's do the last one so last one is um is there a perfect balance of the amount of phytoplankton in a, in water, or does that amount vary from place to place? Is there an ideal? Is there yeah. an ideal phytoplankton? It is, and I I don't know. No, I mean there is a there is a bad amount that we know, which is the one that is responding to some kind of external anthropogenic factor. It will vary from place to place. There is what we call like a you know like we were talking about baseline. So you're gonna have some seasons naturally. You're gonna have higher amounts, lower amounts. And so you have that natural range that would be the quote unquote ideal natural. And then, uh, but it will vary from place to place. It will vary from season to season. It will vary from year to year, even naturally. And then you have the bad amounts, which is when we are somehow affecting those natural communities so much that they are responding Perturbed, to our, yeah. Right, disturbed. But yeah, that's a, the, you guys asked very good questions. I'm really impressed by Well, that's you. great. So so we're we're good. We're gonna stay out here and talk for a while longer, but we're gonna kill our, our dew drop here. So let's everybody unmute for a second and, and say uh, thank you to Joanna. That thank was very you. cool, that was very cool. Thank was you. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, thank you all. so much, it was great. Awesome, you guys. Thanks so much. So I'm going to kill the recording, but if you guys have a question or two that you want to ask individually, you're welcome to uh, to stay. But thanks for showing up, you guys, uh, and I'll see everybody soon.